Melt electro riding, for those who are not familiar, uses a high voltage applied to a nozzle to stabilize a molten jet at low flow rates. This is a very stable process to the extent that we can increase the speed up to the limit of the collector and the jet doesn't snap. You can also notice that as it's landing, it's still a liquid-like structure. We now look at this jet using an infrared camera and you can see the molten polymer at the top and then we have solidification at the collector. Melt electro riding is not just possible on flat collectors, but also onto a mandrel. For this type of print, you have to precisely calculate the fiber positioning for the winding angle, the mandrel diameter, as well as its length. And the visual access to important information in real time is some of the best for any 3D printing technology. If we have a closer look at the jet, the volume of the tailor cone defined by the number of pixels below the nozzle is a wonderful indicator of process stability. With calibration, it can also be a great predictor of fiber diameter in real time. It's important to note that the placement of the fibers and the type of polymer used really defines the overall mechanics. Here on the left, we have that scaffold that we previously saw on the mandrel. And at this particular winding angle and thickness, you get elastic snap through phenomena and the fibers will lock into place. Now, if we don't use polycaprolactone, but use PLCL, which is an amorphous polymer, the mechanics also very different. So while PCL is semi-crystalline and ductile, the lactide and the caprolactone interfere with the crystallization kinetics of each other and you end up with an amorphous polymer. If you have a look at the scaffold on the left, it is a ductile material that when you stretch it beyond its yield point, it's permanently deformed. Whereas here you have it returning back to its original shape. To extend to a different media, there's stop motion, where you can take photographs of this tube at different angles and combine this into a single video. Normal videography using stereo microscopy shows that water swelling fibers can be melt electro ridden. This is a cross linked polyexacylene that will swell when placed in water and it has inherent UV fluorescence. Upon swelling in water, the scaffold detaches from the surface. This particular polyexacylene hydrogel is very soft and flexible. And the elastic modulus is now around about 180 kilopascals. To demonstrate this effect in a printed structure, such a scaffold can be drawn into a glass pipette and ejected out. And this can be done over and over again. Continuing with videography, here is a melt electro written tube where it is sealed with silicone and pressurized with air here and blocked with a plug at the end. You can see that you have fibers going in an almost vertical direction, but there are two fibers going along the top. So now this is videography in a normal speed. And you can see that as you pressurize this, it will coil and then actually coil in the shape that's predetermined by the fiber placement and it actuates quite quickly. Moving forward with this kind of actuator to high speed videography. To encompass this, a fly catcher was made where you have these actuators that can be pressurized to grab and hold the fly for a period of time until it's released. However, photography and videography reaches a certain limit and more detail is required. So an SEM is really one of the most potent methods for determining scaffold morphology and proof that you've made your intended design. Here is a photograph of a melt electro written fiber that is 800 nanometers in diameter. And you can see that there's some optical interference when you get to this micron level diameter. But we really need scanning electron microscopy to get decent visualization. These scaffolds can be written for a whole range of different patterns and structures for tissue engineering. A lot of work has been performed that shows the porosity is around about 80 to 90% and above. So if we have a look at an example of a scaffold where the fibers are 2.5 microns in size and spaced 50 microns apart, this is probably the highest current resolution limit of the technology when making things as perfect in structure as possible in the tightest dimensions possible. And that's because there's some electrostatic attraction of fibers to the highest fibers already deposited, particularly when the spacing between them gets small. 
One of the distinct features of melt electro writing is you can change the diameter of the fiber during the print. And this is an example of a single print with a single nozzle where we can precisely hit a certain fiber diameter. This is a really useful tool for engineers and scientists and clinicians and biologists to be able to discuss what kind of scaffolds are possible to be designed. Here's an example again of a single print with a single nozzle where we had fibers placed in here to catch spheroids and a fiber gradient from small to large was created. If we flip this scaffold over to the bottom, you can see the embossing of the metal collector onto the fiber where it comes in contact. And then we have reductions in diameter down to four microns. Another example of using different diameter fibers was designed as an implant for the periodontal ligament. And in this instance, we wanna have a scaffold 10 micron size fibers, 125 microns apart for the muscle side. If you flip the scaffold over, it's 25 micron size fibers, 250 microns apart for the bone compartment. And in between is a membrane that helps in cell seeding and or the adhesion of the hematoma. This research was done by Elena de Juan Pardo and Petra Mella, where they looked at the natural heart valve structure and basically reverse engineered the structure mechanics using melt electro written fibers in a sinusoidal pattern. Together with fibrin, they're able to make a structure where the approximate mechanics of the heart valve could be replicated. And this is seen in a bioreactor. There are other small design features within melt electro writing that result from serendipity. Here a tubular frame is made and you can see these little spikes on the outside. If we now look inside the lumen, you can see that the first fiber has embossing again. And it's these little spikes on the outside are the result of fibers landing on top of each other and sagging as they're not really that solid by the time they land on the collector. Videos can also be extracted from images. Here, a high resolution SEM image was taken. This allowed post-pressing for us to be able to zoom in and look, to, look at the details and demonstrate here that not only is the fiber quite reproducible in size and shape, but you can see there isn't that spike occurring at the intersections because there is no fiber sagging. So you can control this phenomenon and have these fibers suspended in a very nice way so that you can have cell interactions between the boxes that are made here. Moving forward with a suspended fiber perspective, this is work that was performed several years ago, but only recently published, showing that we can suspend fibers over millimeter distances. And we can control the height of the suspended fiber by printing another series of fibers that control the Z direction. So this is all made in a single print. And I've used here some green false coloring to demonstrate that the top fiber here is actually anchored down These suspended fibers are really fascinating for growing the dorsal root ganglia that's placed on here. And you have neurons that are growing out as well as Schwann cells migrating in a true three-dimensional array. And false coloring is really important within scanning electron microscopy as it brings out images and details. So if I want to show you that we printed three different fibers on top of each other, this looks much better the standard grayscale. SEM allows the visualization of fine details. This is a series of images that we took where we're tilting the fiber wall slightly in an approach called microscale layer shifting. If you offset each layer, especially in a sinusoidal printing mode, you can actually tilt the wall outwards and inwards. So if you determine the mechanics of these tilted walls, they're all quite different from each other. If one was to pull the sample, the top fiber is going to take the load followed by the bottom one. Here, the wall is vertical and all the fibers will take the mechanical load at the same time. However, to really emphasize the ability to accurately place fibers, we can combine these five SEM images into a GIF file and create a stop motion video where you can see that this bottom fiber is in the same spot throughout and you can control the mechanics of that simply by tilting the wall angle. So for example, here we have a post-processed SEM video in which false colors that 
first show that this red fiber here is tilting inwards. Now that top fiber will take the load first, followed by this particular one, and so forth to the bottom fiber. The fiber wall that is green all have vertical fibers. And in this instance, the fibers will take the load exactly at the same time. Whereas the blue false colored wall is tilting outwards such that the bottom fiber is taking the first load. So you have a structure overall that will have different mechanics depending on which direction you will pull it. And this is just based on the slight tilting of the fibers. Moving on from scanning electron microscopy, micro CT is a great way of vis visualizing these fibers because they're not so small and it's well within its capability. In this instance, the scaffold is made with 30 degree lay down patterns. It could be fitted with a model so you can determine the porosity. And as we fill in this animation and take the fibers away, you can see that the porosity and the interconnectivity of the scaffold. Optical coherence tomography is also a recent addition to techniques to characterize melt lecture writing. And this is a fascinating way to be able to measure the fiber diameter during the print so that you don't have to do any post manufacturing measurements. And the level of detail is excellent to the point that without microscale layer shifting, you can see the fiber wall is tilting inwards. But after you do some correction, you can show that this fiber is vertical with OCT. Now the area within melt electro writing that really needs further work is fluorescence microscopy. If we have a look at a three-dimensional reconstruction of a neural network in a melt electro written scaffold, we can see where the fibers are, but there is no inherent fluorescence within them. So as you have a look at this particular video, the melt electro written fibers are invisible. There have been papers in the past where we've noticed that if you place DAPI for the nuclei staining, and you don't wash the scaffold sufficiently, you can get a nice fluorescent staining on the fiber. In this case, both the nuclei and the fibers are stained, although it's clear which one is which. Whenever you try and combine melt electro writing with a chemical fluorophore, we do see the fluorescence, but this is something that decays with time. This is one thing that really does require improvement to have a fluorescently visible scaffolds being made. So in summary, Imaging is an essential part for melt electro writing to prove its manufacture, as well as in the process control imaging of the jet. The scaffolds look excellent under scanning electron microscopy, stereo microscopy. However, one of the current weaknesses is fluorescence imaging and being able to see these fibers in a very nice way is something for the future. Finally, I'd like to thank all these fantastic people who have worked with me over the years. They've primarily been masters and PhD students who are really dedicated and worked above and beyond the call on this technique. And I'm so grateful for them, uh, to them for working so hard on this approach.